Thanks to the Google Pixel 7 Pro for sponsoring this video. Who is it? Who, who's there? Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that definitely isn't standing right behind you. If you've spent any time watching the channel recently, you know that we are in love with the world of analog horror. There are countless incredible independent filmmakers here on YouTube telling some of the most compelling and scariest stories in modern entertainment right now. I'm talking stuff like the Walton Files, the Backrooms, the Mandela Catalog, stories that all have an iconic look and feel because they're largely set in the 80s, 90s, and early aughts. This was a time when video tech was first becoming widely available and finding its footing. Camcorders were giant boxes that you had to cart around with you. And if you actually wanted to film something, well, you also had to bring along a library's worth of physical tapes to record on. No exaggeration, my family had a literal cooler-sized bag just to carry everything we needed to film like 30 minutes of the family Christmas. And even then, the footage we got was rough. When something moved, the footage got blurry. When it was dark, it got grainy. Most of the time, you just left what you shot on the recording tapes because transferring it to an actual VHS tape you could play required a master's degree in arranging wires and cables from the camcorder to the VCR, and then once you actually watched what you made, your mileage varied. I'm guessing no one watching right now has ever even heard of a tracking button on a remote control before, right? That ringing bells for anyone? Well, you know those blurry lines that go across the screen in pretty much all analog horror uploads? Those were most often caused by a misalignment of the tape inside the VHS and the playback head inside the VCR, and tracking was the button that you used to help sync those two things up. This is the awkward puberty era of tech that I'm talking about, and that's what I love about these analog horror series. They're videos that take the early limitations of tech from the era and use them to create genuine, authentic, memorable scares. Now, at the top of the episode, you heard that this video is being sponsored by the Google Pixel 7 Pro. In fact, that whole opening was filmed on the phone's camera, a camera that just has a ton of amazing features. We had to work really hard to make the footage from this thing look old and scary like analog horror. Just take a look at this. This is the final shot, but watch as we remove one filter, two, get rid of the vignette, and a final effect. Boom! This is the original footage that we were working with, and it looks looks fantastic, which got me thinking, what would modern analog horror look like? The aesthetic of analog horror is built off these technological limitations of 80s and 90s home video, motion blur, no ability to see in the dark, things that are just barely visible off in the distance. But those limitations don't exist today. Just look at the Google Pixel 7 Pro, a phone small enough to fit in your pocket but equipped with a camera smart enough to challenge tech 10 times its size. Motion blur isn't a problem because it has image stabilization. In fact, the blur is in your control with features like cinematic blur, keeping the subject in focus and blurring the background. Is it too dark? Not a problem. The Google Pixel 7 Pro has night sight, where you can take a picture in almost absolute darkness and still wind up with something to show for it. Oh, is there something off in the distance that's too far to truly make out? Again, it's not a problem. This itty bitty piece of tech now has a five times zoom telephoto lens and records in 4K, so that scary pile of pixels off in the woods is just the non-scary pile of rocks that it always was. I gotta be honest with you, we have great cameras here in the studio to film on, but most of the shoots that we do at this point are on Pixel phones because the cameras are high quality, they're easy to use, and they're smart. The shots will look better because the camera is largely doing a lot of the work for us. So this then begs the question, is modern technology too good to make effective analog horror? Could an analog horror series take place in the modern day when everyone and their grandmother has access to a high quality camera sitting in their pocket? Today we're looking at the tropes of analog horror to see what the equivalent would be if it was themed around today. In 20 to 30 years, when people look back at this era of entertainment, what will the retro tech horror stories look and feel like? Curl up and hide under the blankets, loyal theorists. We're about to find out. So before we can really jump into the idea of modern tech being too good to make analog horror, we should first take a step back to fully understand what makes the 80s and 90s tech so perfect for this type of storytelling. Like I mentioned in the intro, series like The Walton Files, Backrooms, Mandela Catalog, all of them are made to look like they were filmed on ancient camcorders. They have that iconic jittery 
blurry VHS look. This sort of technology became cheap enough to mass produce by the 1980s and were fairly common by the 1990s. That's why so many of these series take place in this era of content. It's also where we get the analog part of the label analog horror. These old camcorders used analog signals to write information onto actual magnetic strips. An analog signal is basically some sort of thing that constantly changes to represent different data points. This could be the heights or frequencies of wavelengths, like with radio signals, or even stuff that's simple, like a record where it reads the heights of grooves on the record and then translates that into an audio output. Because analog recordings are literal waves, there's an infinite amount of detail that you can get in there, but it also makes it more likely to have interference, like you see with television static. Hence why old TVs had antennas that you could use to fine-tune the signal. By contrast, digital signals are discrete packages that are stored as units of ones and zeros. A digital recording takes snapshots of the analog signal at a certain rate. The higher the rate, the closer to the original signal you're gonna get. Instead of encoding information onto a physical tape like with analog, digital signals store it onto memory cards. Anyway, at that time, analog tapes had the potential to be decent quality, but it turns out that the tech wasn't exactly the ideal solution for long-term storage. See, magnetic tape begins to degrade after 10 to 20 years if it isn't stored properly, meaning the footage gets blurry, it gets glitchy, corrupted. Here's a friendly reminder to convert all your old home videos into digital if you haven't already here, folks. What's more, the footage from these old cameras and camcorders was often interlaced. Have you ever paused an old video and noticed that any motion blur seems to have this weird series of horizontal lines running through it? That means that the footage was interlaced. Each single frame of the video only had about half the information needed for the full image. The rest of the image used the previous frame, meaning that any motion would be slightly offset and thus the horizontal lines. This drastically cut the amount of data needed for the full video, making it easier to both store and broadcast, but it also resulted in huge losses in quality. The opposite of this is known as progressive scan, where an entire image's worth of video is shown in each individual frame. You ever notice when you select the quality of a YouTube video it says something like 1080p? Well, the P stands for progressive scan, and almost all video shot today uses that as the standard. Regardless, the lower quality interlaced video being played on a big old CRT screen helped to create the iconic flickering look that we now associate with old videos from this era. And you see, that's why it works so well for horror made on a budget. Not only is this sort of technology really cheap nowadays, but the look is easy to recreate in post-production using modern editing software. Like here, BAM! Our editors just threw a bunch of effects on this to make it look like an old VHS, and it's what, like two layers in After Effects? This lets young filmmakers create something that's immediately stylish, atmospheric, set in a clear time and place in history. What's more important though, is that they're also able to use this aesthetic to amplify what makes the series scary. This look creates an intentional lack of clarity. See, when you introduce a scary idea but you don't show that scary thing, what your audience imagines in their head is far more horrifying than anything you could possibly come up with yourself. It doesn't matter what medium you're in. The ideas used to great effect in the Cthulhu Mythos books, and a ton of the most iconic horror movies of all time have embraced this exact idea. Is your mechanical shark animatronic not working? Don't worry, just don't show the shark for the majority of the movie, and it's gonna wind up being way more effective and way scarier. And it's this lack of clarity that really intensifies the actual horror that analog horror is based on, that what's familiar can be deadly. Look at the three series that I keep using as examples. Mandela Catalog is all about our friends and neighbors being imposters. The Walton Files is about a family-friendly burger restaurant that turns deadly. And The Back Rooms is about the horror of mundane walls and fluorescent lights. These aren't supernatural creatures, these are series that rely on the normal people and places around us, but made unnatural and scary. This idea that the familiar can hurt you is probably best exemplified by another trend that came out of this era, Stranger Danger. Though the term dates back all the way to the 1960s, it didn't catch fire until 1979, when a child in Manhattan was tragically kidnapped while walking to school. News media grabbed hold of the story, who spread it nationwide, and soon began widely reporting similar cases of missing kids. This culminated in 1982, when it was widely reported that nearly 50,000 American children were being kidnapped by strangers every year. And uh, just so we're crystal clear on this, that number is wildly inflated. But it managed to cement the idea that all strangers can be potentially dangerous in the minds of the nation. And there were PSAs and school assemblies drilling that idea into people throughout the 80s and 90s, even up through the mid-2000s. But these analog horror series also play off another innate human fear, the uncanny valley. This is a phenomenon that many psychologists have noticed where people have strong negative reactions to things that look almost human, but aren't quite all the way there. Insert any low-budget, poorly executed CGI here. But again, this is where analog horror shines. Without the budget to pay for pristine, photorealistic, computer-generated worlds, these stories lean into the unsettling nature of things that are slightly off from reality. 
The alternates from Mandela catalog are stretched, deformed human monsters. They're almost human, but not quite. The animatronics of Walton's restaurants exhibit jerky movements and speak in dead, emotionless, pre-recorded phrases. The back rooms takes a generic office layout, but then twists it into something that's not built by human hands. Something that on the surface looks familiar, but where the nuances don't match up. The layout doesn't quite work with what those spaces would actually look and feel like if it was actually made by humans. Things are just slightly off, which keeps us off balance and nervous. But having laid all of that out, you can start to see the problem here, right? Modern technology just isn't super compatible with that flavor of classic analog horror. Our cameras are too good, and there's just a lot of them everywhere. And even if you are working with older, blurry footage today, there are upscaling programs that are able to use complex algorithms to increase the quality of footage near flawlessly. So if we were to sit here and think about what modern analog horror would be, what would it look like? If current analog horror thrives on the limitations of the technology from the past, what will the creators of the future be exploiting to scare us with stories about today? Since clarity of image isn't an issue anymore, we'd need to find something about contemporary technology that is scary. Honestly, I had to really think about this one. I mean, there are some obvious answers like social media and that everyone shares a ton of information about themselves online and not everyone is what they seem, but that's not super unique. Those stories are already being told by Hollywood. We all understand the scare potential there. It's also not a true parallel to analog horror. Again, the genre is about the limitations of filming equipment. Equipment that today seems to have no limitation. And therein lies the answer, I think. That right there is the point. Not that the video gets blurry in the dark or that a shaky camera obscures the movement of a monster as it comes toward you. In an ironic twist, where analog horror as we know it's rooted in the limitations of technology from the 80s and 90s, I expect creators of analog horror in the future to lean into the idea that technology became too good in the 2020s. That what we define as photorealism has actually evolved beyond reality, now able to create realities that never even existed in the first place. What made me think of this was actually the Pixel 7. There's this feature in the camera called Magic Eraser, which lets you go into your photos after you take them to remove small objects in the background. It does this using AI, filling in the space left by the object with information about the space around it. It is, without exaggeration, an incredible tool. It helps you to create the perfect moment even if you weren't able to capture it at the time. I cannot tell you the amount of times that Steph and I have woken up at 4 a.m. just to get a picture in front of some landmark without hordes of people lingering in the background. Magic Eraser solves that problem instantly, getting me extra sleep while we're on vacation, which I am so thankful for. But Magic Eraser also shows how instantaneous this sort of tech is getting. Literally, you rub your finger and stuff in the background disappears. It erases people out of a moment in time. It is literally creating a new reality with just the touch of a finger. And sure, this sort of stuff has always been possible to some extent thanks to photo editing software, but the ease and speed at which it's possible now with the Magic Eraser is incredible. And we're not just talking about correcting photos either. I'm sure you've seen the news about AI with the ability to create artwork from using just a few keywords. My friends over at Corridor Digital have been experimenting with this sort of content creation for a while now. And let me tell you, AI image generation is even getting to a point where you feed it a bunch of pictures of an individual person and you can get it to spit out high quality artistic interpretations of that person in almost any style you want. No joke, companies are already starting to talk to me about how this sort of technological advancement could be used to automatically generate video thumbnails in the near future. And it's not just stopping at still images either. We've already done two episodes dedicated to the ways that Hollywood has taken people's likenesses and putting them onto other bodies. How we're now able to synthesize voices from audio clips. Things like that. There are even computer programs that allow you to take the voices of real people and convert them into AI voices, so you can then get those voices to say anything you want. And again, people are contacting me about this exact sort of thing, so that my auto-generated voice can exist forever reading these scripts as the eternal online theorist. And this is no longer a cumbersome process either. It's getting to the point where you can literally deepfake someone in real time on video calls. I mean, can you imagine how frightening it would be if these technologies combined, and you could speak with someone's actual voice and face? That's not only terrifying, it's also incredibly believable in the near future. And if I were to make any sort of modern analog horror set in the present day, it would embrace this technology for its storytelling. It would have to be about AIs creating a reality that was never actually real in the first place. So, say we wanted to make something similar to the Mandela catalog. The alternates and intruder could be people deep faked in real time. On the surface, they look normal, but something about them is just off, or they don't sound quite right. It could be about tricking you into false memories about your own life, and AI serving you up videos of things that you've said and done that you know that you have never said or done before. Your memories being gaslit and your physical body being erased from moments in time that you know you were there for. But slowly, bit by bit, the evidence starts to stack up against you. Pics or it didn't happen, you know? And the pics don't show you for whatever reason. The back rooms 
backrooms are even easier to work with here. Our running theory has been that the world of the backrooms is just one big simulated reality that's become glitched. Something that becomes a lot scarier if we imagine an AI overlord tweaking things and people in real time. Changing a face here, creating a neighborhood out of thin air there. When it detects a problem, it overcorrects its reality, perhaps leading people to glitch out in the first place. Instead of the intentional lack of clarity like with the 80s and 90s era tech, here we're leaning into the hyper reality of all of this. There's too much detail. There's too much precision. So much, in fact, that you begin to doubt yourself, your memories, your own identity. Humans are fallible. The computer's memory, meanwhile, is not. The big themes of this modern analog horror would come down to having your viewers question if what they're seeing is even real, and whether or not we're just seeing a reality through computers, or if we're seeing what's actually in front of our faces. Now that is terrifying. Someone should probably do a series like that someday, huh? But hey! You know what isn't scary? The brand spanking new Google Pixel 7 Pro. Real talk, I adore the Google Pixel series of phones. I've been using them since Gen 1, and like I said at the top of the video, a lot of team theorists is like me and have been using them for years. Lee, who's been on the team longer than almost anyone here, he's been using a Pixel 2 XL since it came out and loves it to pieces. And after getting some hands-on time with the Pixel 7 for this video, he can't wait to upgrade and get one for himself. The phone has a ton of other awesome new features that we didn't get a chance to touch on today, including a live translation feature that can interpret and translate 48 languages in real time. There's also a live caption feature that basically takes any speech audio running through the phone and captions it in real time. We use captions a lot during our research, so this one is a lifesaver. Plus, the phone itself looks gorgeous. There's this new metal bar running across the camera that not only offers protection, but also really pops against the color of the phone. Looks awesome. Again, thank you so much to Google and the Pixel 7 Pro for sponsoring this video and letting us film this video. And as always, remember, it's just a theory. A film theory! And cuts!